in Auckland. I was a Scotland resident in Auckland and it was an amazing experience. And I've been to New Zealand many times and, um, you know, obviously the Anzac connection is just a very special, incredible country and always been amazed by the amazing community there. And really impressed that you guys have decided to spend the first day of the new year straight after Rosh Hashanah to learn together with us in Jerusalem. So I appreciate that and look forward to learning together. If anyone has any questions or um, wants to interrupt or anything, feel free to do it in the chat or to interrupt me in the middle or whatever suits. Um, and what I'd like to do is, um, I know that most people, I mean, I think you guys, most of you davened in lockdown yesterday, so people did it by themselves. So I wanted to unpack one of the key prayers, um, just one word in that key prayer that will hopefully help transition us from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur when we're going to be saying that prayer again. Um, and hopefully it gives us three ways to approach the new year with three perspectives that can make it that much more meaningful. So the famous prayer of the Unatana Tokef must be one of the most powerful prayers ever penned. The words are evocative, the drama is passionate, the imagery is tangible, and the rhythm is really intense. We fathom every deed as God is writing and sealing, counting and numbering, and remembering everything that's forgotten. Suddenly, amidst the commotion, the chazan changes the tone. And I don't know the tune that they did it in your lockdown in your home, um, but when I was singing in the South Head Choir, which got um, became Kadima when I was a kid, um, we I, I, I sang the baritone part. So I'm going to um, sing with you what happens at that moment, but you can really feel the tangible presence of what happens in this Unatana Tokev prayer. Uva shofar gadol Yitaka Vekol mamadaka Vekol mamadaka So Uva shofar gadol, there's a huge, a great shofar that's sounding. The cold mamadaka, there's a small, still voice, our conscience piercing. And the angels are trembling. Because it's the day of judgment, the period we're in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is happening. And then the choir carries on. Which means all the dwellers of the world, all of humankind, all the inhabitants that happen to be in our universe will pass before God, Kivne Maron, like the children of Maron. And this is the one word I want to pick on. Kivne Maron, what does it mean, the children of Maron? What does Maron mean? And hopefully, with this idea, we can transition, we can bridge from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Um, and really connect in this deep way as we approach this time. So does anyone know what B'nai Maron are? Does anyone know what the term Maron means? So basically, first of all, I want to give a shout out to the child in the screen. It says Avi, who's I'm guessing her dad or maybe her mom. But it's great to see the young face and to see all your faces there. Um, and so essentially, there's three different opinions brought in the Gemara as to what the, what the term Maron means. Right? This is the Gemara, the Talmud. Um, the oral law in um, Daf Yud Chet, on the 18th page. And essentially, the three opinions that it brings is the first opinion is that the word Maron comes from the word Imrana. And Imrana in Aramaic means sheep. Because what happened was that fa farmers and shepherds used to count their sheep during the tithing when they have to count one in 10. Like imagine there's hundreds of sheep. Like I was driving the other day from Malea de Mim by the Dead Sea up to Jerusalem, and there was Bedouin um, people with huge like flocks of sheep, shepherds with hundreds and hundreds of sheep, right? And it's impossible to count all those sheep at once to keep track. So they used to have a pen where the sheep went, and there'd be a very, very narrow entrance that literally one at a time would have to squeeze through to be able to get in. And that way they could count them one every 10 to know how many there are. So Imran are like sheep, right? that we're judged like sheep. Why like sheep? Because they counted one at a time. So, so too, we are judged one at a time. The second opinion is that the word Maron refers to the Maron area up north in Israel. And there's a hill there that's got a very, very, very steep, narrow path. 
And it's a very dangerous path. It's easy to fall off to either side. And therefore, just as to walk up the path, you have to walk one at a time because it's too dangerous to walk with more. So too, God is judging us one at a time, just like when we walk up the path. And the third and final opinion is that the word maron comes from the word marut, which means authority, or kivinu marun, which in um, Greek um, refers to an army. And it's like the soldiers of the house of David. And just like soldiers walk single file, so too, we are judged one at a time, single file. Now, that's the shot level. That's the basic understanding. If you think about it, all three of these metaphors are there to concretize one idea, whether it's walking up the steep hill one at a time, whether it's counting sheep one at a time, or whether it's single file in the army, we are all one at a time. And when we're standing before God with all our incredible things, but also vulnerable with some of the things that maybe we shouldn't have done, we may want to be able to hide behind our teachers or our grandparents or our matriarchs or patriarchs or be part of a much larger audience. But especially now, and this is very fitting for lockdown, when we're one at a time, we don't even have a minyan around us. We're sitting in our own home. Um, between now, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, God is looking at us one at a time with our, all our frailties, with all our foibles and with all our incredible successes and all the amazing things we've done. And there's no one to hide behind. Now, I think that in and of itself is a powerful image and we could stop the shear there. And if we can concentrate on that idea. But I'd like to ask the question, if we want to say that message, then why didn't the Gemara say, Why didn't it say all of humankind, all of the inhabitants will pass through one at a time? Why does it need to use any metaphor? And if it's going to use a metaphor, why use three different metaphors? Right? Why not literally just say one at a time? Why need to talk about sheep or a slope or talk about the army? Everyone with me with the question? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest that each of the opinions in the Gemara can give us a different perspective by which we can approach one at a time in lockdown in New Zealand at this incredible auspicious occasion as you conclude Som Gedalia and as we're one week away from Yom Kippur with yesterday being Rosh Hashanah. How do we approach this? And this I think, can offer us three perspectives. The first one is sheep. There's a lot of things we don't want to be like sheep for, right? There's a lot of things that we don't want to use sheep as a metaphor for how we should live our lives. But I'd like to focus on one, which I believe is something we can learn from sheep. By the way, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say anything, but I think in New Zealand, we know about sheep. So basically, the idea is that when I was becoming more religious, you know, I grew up in Sydney, Australia by Bondi Beach. I grew up in a traditional Zionist family, um, amazing family. My parents are actually here now from Australia. Um, they made it out. We hadn't seen them for nearly two years. Um, and they're now, you have to be here for minimum three months. So they're here with us. So it's very special to be with them. I've got two sisters that still live in Australia. I was the Dean of Mariah College um, with 1800 students in Australia after going there myself. Um, so I'm very, you know, acquainted with the Southern Hemisphere. I was very involved there. Um, and essentially, when I was becoming religious, I wasn't religious. And I went on a B'nai Kiva program with New Zealanders, South Africans, and Australians, Australians, end of grade 10. And when I was becoming more religious, one of, the far, my, one of the hardest things for me, the greatest challenge, was what I call intellectual humility. I could not comprehend the fact that there were some things that I could not comprehend. I hope everyone comprehended what I just said. I couldn't comprehend the fact that there were some things that I couldn't comprehend. Like I was a guy that liked to know the reason for anything. And, and, and there were some things that I couldn't comprehend. Many have argued that knowledge is power. And while Judaism holds knowledge in the highest esteem, it provides a motivation which also serves as a limitation called faith. Faith is something, faith in something or someone implies trust. And trust makes us vulnerable, right? If you're married, if you have children, if you have parents, if you're part of a community, and you know that there's meant to be a shear at 7.30 p.m., you had faith that it was going to be there. Otherwise, you'd just be sitting here by yourself. If it was in person, you'd go out, get in your car, meet someone somewhere, and you have faith that someone's going to meet you there. That is how faith, you know, I understand faith. It's the same in God because everything is based on a relationship. It's our relationship with God, right? And that's what it really means. It means that we cannot completely understand or control any given situation and we have to rely on others. And it's crazy, you know, especially in these COVID times. You know, we take a step back, we check the weather to plan for the next day, we pay experts to give us confidence and self-confidence in almost every area, and constantly push the envelope in science to understand as much as we can about the world around us. 
And I think this is all positive. Yet there are elements of our lives that are out of our control. And there's nothing more than this time that could have shown that or suggested that. We see some of the healthiest people suddenly getting sick. And some of the greatest ideas never find success. On the other hand, we meet people with unhealthy habits who live long and healthy lives. And people who would never expect to do well succeeding. We can try to explain so much. But there are some things we will never truly understand. To have faith in God requires what I believe is one of the most difficult challenges of the 21st century intellectual humility. While this is countercultural in our society, I think a healthy sense of faith can go a long way. So, my wife has started this um, incredible initiative called Keshev, um, which is helping people with mental health um, in Israel with mental health issues. And I saw some of the research according to Anxiety and Depression Association of America. 40 million Americans over the age of 18 are affected by anxiety. This is nearly one in five people making it the most common mental illness. According to a John Hopkins Health Alert, these people spend on average five hours a day worrying. Doesn't mean like five hours they go, okay, I'm gonna go sit and worry. But between what they're doing right in the back of their mind, they spend five hours a day worrying. So what about general warriors? What about the four in five people that aren't considered to have a disorder? So according to the study, they spend an average of 55 minutes a day worrying. That can't possibly be the most efficient or effective use of time. But in our high pressured society, it's impossible not to feel anxious at some stage. If someone has a disorder, it's naive to think that faith will simply cure it. But I think, you know, everyone in, in this group, you know, there's probably over 50 people here with over 30 devices unplugged in and multiple people in different rooms in different, with different devices. You know, between us, there's somewhere between probably 45 minutes and five hours a day that all of us spend worrying. Now, if you break your day into the different parts of time, again, it doesn't mean you sit into a place and worry. It means like overall, you're in the car and you worry for a bit. You're on your phone and you worry a bit. In the back of your mind, you're doing something. You're not fully intentional and fully in the moment. But, you know, if you break down the day, take out the time you go to the bathroom, the time you eat, your time you drink, your time you sleep, right? Those are things that everyone does. You can't really control there goes somewhere between five and 10 hours of your time. If there's any teenagers, maybe a bit more sleeping, right? And then you put in the time of university, of work, of anything that you have an obligation to do. There goes another, you know, between five hours and 10 hours, depending on how much you work. And then you've got other obligations, chores, you know, different things that you have to take care of, responsibilities. There's not much time left. It can't be the most constructive use of time to be able to be worrying all the time. I'm not saying that it's simple to just not do it. I'm just saying it's important we should be conscious of it. I think what faith does, right, is it's the capacity to understand that there's some things that I just can't control. And if I try control them, they will control me. Right? The second I try control something that I can't control, it's going to control me. Looking on the, you know, looking on the internet another four times a day, whether the COVID restrictions will be lifted tomorrow or in three days time is not going to change the COVID restrictions. It's just going to distract you more from living in this moment right now. It's normal to check it once a day. It's normal to check it. But many of us get obsessive and spend too much time on it. And it's just not going to help pushing refresh on the news, on the news website. Isn't going to make it come quicker. Right. And I'm sure every single one of us can relate to other areas in our own lives that are like that. When a sheep is directed to be counted, there is no turning back and the flow of the other sheep propel it forward. Perhaps this first analogy comparing us to sheep serves to encourage us to embrace the fact that we cannot know, control, or understand everything. Being comfortable with areas we cannot control allows us to focus on areas that we can control. And this will lead to the thrust of the other two meanings behind the term B'nai Maron. So the first meaning we said was like sheep. And I think one thing we can learn from sheep is that intellectual humility to go with the flow in areas of our lives that we can't control. Now, what about the second interpretation? What about areas we can control in our life? Before we identify what those areas are, how do we develop them? What do we do with them? What's a motivational factor? So remember, we talked about the steep slope in the B'nai Maron area that only one person at a time could um, go up and it was extremely steep and dangerous on each side. So every element of our lives is being compartmentalized so that we can get closer towards perfection. To become an elite sportsman, for example, I don't know those of you that watched the Olympics recently, 
It's a full-time job. Each muscle group needs to be isolated and developed through hydrotherapy, weight training, fitness development, match conditioning with close monitoring by trainers, coaches, medical professionals, in person and through sophisticated software and hardware, not to mention the individualized diets and studying of the opponent's style, ideal footwear, equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really a full-time job. Used to be that, you know, you grow up, you get a ball, you play football, you play rugby, you play netball, whatever it is, and you learn how to play, but it's become such a focused you know, intense place where you have physiotherapists and massages, everything that's carrying you through it. But that's just a, a, a one symptom of, of, of the broader generation. And there's amazing, beautiful things about it that we become so good at certain things. My sister is studying medicine in Australia, right? And in order to specialize, you obviously need to do a specialty. What if you want to be a general practitioner, i.e. the opposite of specialization, you want to be broad. You even need to specialize in that, right? You have to specialize to be general. Everything in our lives. I'll give another small example. When I was running Mariah College, I did an experiment um, with a group of girls in my office. They were obsessed with the, the um, it was called the ball, right? The formal, like a prom, a dance at the end of the year. And um, they were like debating. They were going to Europe, right? To, um, to basically party and see country and whatever after they finished school. And they were debating if they should come to Israel as well. And it was an extra few hundred dollars to be in Israel for a bit of time once they go to Europe anyway. And they're like, ah, oh, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. So I'm like, look, guys, you've been speaking about this formal for the last six months, eight months, and it's in a month or two. Let's work out how much money you spend that night. And then let's decide if it's worth it. So I actually wrote it down here. Um, and I brought it for this just to give you guys an understanding. And I'm sure well, the Australian dollar has gone down, but I'm sure the cost of all these things has gone up in the last few years. So this is what these girls um, spent, right? $45 on hair, $90 on makeup, $50 on a spray tan, $60 on nails, $400 on a dress, $80 on shoes, $100 on jewelry, $80 on a, on a clutch. For those of you that don't know what it is, I didn't know what it was either. It's a handbag. $40 on a limo, $170 on a partner if you want to bring someone over, $50 on drinks. I don't know what they were drinking. Like water isn't that expensive. So it was a bit strange to me, but... Uh, $50 on drinks, basically over a thousand dollars. And this, like those people that spent a lot more on a few hours, right? On pre drinks, this party, and that's it, an after party, right? On this one night. And essentially, the point of what I'm trying to say without getting distracted of any of these examples, whether it's sport, whether it's work, whether it's university, we, whether it's this dance, we specialize, we focus, we hyper focus on everything. But what about the one area? that we could focus on life. So many people have a plan for their job. So many people have a plan, even when they go on a vacation, what I'm going to bring, what I'm going to wear, where I'm going to go, what trek I'm going to do, etc. How many of us have a plan for life? That this is what I want to look like in five years time, in one year time, not physically, but this is the kind of person I want to be. This is the kind of Jew that I want to be. This is the kind of husband, the kind of wife, the kind of grandparent, the kind of friend, the kind of member of a community. How many of us actually conceive of that idea? And I'd argue, and I put myself in the same category, we don't really do it enough, right? We focus on so many areas of our lives, but our spiritual growth and the type of people we want to become, we often neglect. But as we're judged at this time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as individuals ascending the steep path around Maron, we're forced to move forward. Because if you try on a steep path to stand still, you're going to fall backwards. You have to be pushing forward or you're never going to get anywhere. We move forward in so many areas of our lives, but we don't focus on this area. If one was not careful on the slope and fell to the left or right, they would fall off entirely. If they weren't moving forward with purpose and direction, they'd move backwards due to the gradient of the slope. And this is the perfect metaphor for life. When we meet our maker and we build at this time leading up to Yom Kippur as we begin this new year on this awesome day, one at a time, we are challenged to consider our personal growth and ask whether we are the best person that we can be. Are we spending enough time with our family? Giving enough money to stuck up? Learning the timeless wisdom containing the Torah? Engaging consistently in chesed? Challenging ourselves in any area that we find important that we want to invest in? And that's the second idea I wanted to share. And the reason I think the Gemara brings a second opinion because like a slope, we need to be pushing forward. 
we need to be not just going through life, but growing through life if we really want to achieve anything. And finally, the third and final part, um, the, the third example we said was the soldiers. They understood it like the Chayalim Shal Beit David, the soldiers of the house of David. Why soldiers? We said single file. But again, why soldiers? We can use any other example. So there's a beautiful um, novel um, called Ah, But Your Land is Beautiful, written by Alan Patton. And it tells a South African author, and it tells a story of a headmaster in South Africa who took his white students to compete against non, a non-white school during the time of apartheid. When the Department of Education told him that he could no longer do this, he resigned in protest. And the leader of the black community came to ask him why. And the following conversation ensued. And I want to read it to you um, because I've got it here. And I'll read you exactly what, what he wrote in this book. And he basically said, I resign because I think it's time to go out and fight everything that separates people from one another. Do I look like a, sh a knight in shining armor? So the, the other person says back to, back to him, yes, you look like a knight in shining armor, but you're going to get wounded. Do you know that? And he responds, I expect that may happen. And he says, you're going to wear the shining armor too? And he says, yes, and I'm going to get wounded too not only by the government, but also my own people. And he said back, are you worried about your wounds? And this is the crux and this is the end of it. He turns back and he says, I don't worry about the wounds. When I get up there, turn, pointing up to Shammai and pointing up to heaven, when I get up there, which is my intention, the Holy One will say to me, where are your wounds? And if I say I haven't any, he will say, was there nothing worth fighting for? I couldn't answer that question. Super powerful, right? Where are your wounds? And if you don't have any wounds, was there really nothing worth fighting for? That you get out of this life unscathed? There's nothing worth putting in and risking anything for? And today we are standing before the Holy One on the Day of Judgment. If we have no wounds, are we suggesting we had nothing fighting, worth fighting for? Or do others have wounds so that we can continue to do our thing the way we want. Only three weeks ago, a soldier, 21-year-old, in the Gaza border, was defending so that we could be safe in Australia, in New Zealand, in South Africa, in Canada, in America, me here in Jerusalem. A 21-year-old was shot. And last week, unfortunately, he succumbed to his wounds and passed away. When he got up there, this Rosh Hashanah, he can say there was something worth fighting for. He put everything on the line for all of us. It doesn't have to be so extreme. Of course not. On a little level, is it worth sacrificing that extra Netflix episode potentially to be able to help Noam and Elisheva, to be part of the community, to come to an extra shiur, to give something, to help someone in need, to make a phone call to someone that's feeling lonely? Is it worth doing that? Little bit of Netflix to take a little bit of time, to have half an hour less sleep, to be able to help in that way. Whatever it is in our own lives, right, on a small level. And yes, on a deeper level, on a bigger level, what are we sacrificing for? I had a really interesting conversation. As I said, I used to run a, a Jewish day school. And um, I was speaking to, you know, some grandparents who told me how much they sacrificed to be able to send their kids to the school. And now their kids aren't willing to sacrifice what they called a fancier holiday in order to be able to send their kids to the Jewish school, right? How these times change and everyone has their own priorities in life and no one's judging anyone and everyone in their own level should consider what it is that's worth sacrificing. But I can tell you that every single one of us have certain things, right? That we can put a little bit more effort into. And I think that's the reason that it's compared to soldiers. Because who like soldiers, where there was a 21-year-old a few weeks ago that put their lives on, on the line? Who like soldiers do that? What are our wounds? This is the measure of what is truly important to us. And while we may emerge unscathed, we also emerge with less achievements. So as we're counted as individuals, like the sheep, ascending a slope, or as soldiers, let's be proud of what we've achieved. We've achieved a lot and your community is incredible. And the fact that every single one of you are taking the time 
as we just start the new year to learn together with us is really remarkable. But let us also ask honestly, how can we improve for next year? Like the sheep, what areas will we let go of and humbly embrace the fact that there are some things we can't control so we can focus on the things we can? Like the slope, how will we be focusing on the important things in life to make sure we're truly growing and moving forward? And like the soldiers, what areas will we choose that are worth focusing on? What areas will we identify as truly worth fighting for? These are three difficult questions. But the way we live our lives is ultimately our only answer. And as we embark on these Aseri Mechuvah and these 10 days of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as we grow towards a special day, I challenge every single one of us to consider what are the areas we need to let go of like the sheep? What are the things we're wasting too much time on that we really shouldn't care about what that person thinks of us? Something that we can't control if we can change us or not because we know we can't. Again, logically, it's easy to say this. It's harder to actually do it. Pick one of them that you can try to do it. How do we push forward and make sure we're growing like the slope? And how, like the soldiers, do we identify the areas that are worth fighting for? I give us a bracha, a blessing, that every single one of us is able to identify these areas to truly grow in a meaningful way, that we can continue to learn, to grow together in this new year. Hopefully, if you guys enjoyed, we can get another chance to learn together. Hopefully, not, not too distant future, we can host you here in Jerusalem. In my sukkah here, you can come um, for Sukkot maybe, but otherwise later in the year. Um, and really a huge thank you, first of all, to Norman and Elisheva for initiating this, for everything they do to the community. I know that when they, you know, judged in this time, they've got a lot of schuyot, a lot of merits, thanks to the incredible work they do with each and every one of you. And really to thank every single one of you for taking the time, for investing with all of us, for giving what you have to the community, not just as individuals, but also as a collective. And hopefully we can live a truly beautiful, meaningful, purposeful life. May, you be, may your name be written and your family and sealed for a good year ahead. Shana Tova o Mituka. Shana Tova. Toda ba, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Toda wow. ba. You can see people clapping hands. So. Toda ba. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rabbi. I don't know, personally, I feel like that's exactly what I needed after a Rosh Hashanah at home. It really, uh, at least for me, it boosted me up. So thank you so much for Absolutely. taking the time. And um, just so all of you know here, uh, Rabbi's writing now on the group, but um, he is so popular. You can find so many uh, videos and different talks and subjects and um, all so interesting. Norm and I were flicking through all of them and enjoying each each and every one of them. So um, in the chat of the group, you guys can see now that um, there's a few links there where you can um, check out the rabbi and hear more. Um, and to thank you all um, for taking the time tonight to be with us and to have a little bit of learning. We really enjoyed seeing you guys here better than nothing. So uh, we hope you're all well and, and keeping well. And um, highly recommended to go into the chat. And Rabbi, is that a WhatsApp group you have that you? Yeah, you I know? put a few people message me individually here, so I just put it publicly. There's a Facebook, Instagram, website, and WhatsApp chat if anyone wants. But um, I prefer in person. But it'd be good to connect when we can't do these kinds of opportunities yeah. um, digitally. So feel free to take any of those down. And Norm and Eli Sheva can send it out after I'll send yeah, it to you. We'll, yeah. We will put it on we'll our We'll post Facebook. it on our Facebook as well. So all Does anyone want to ask any questions or do we want to just conclude? <laughs> I always do a little bit less than the time because I think less is more. But if <laughs> anyone's got any question on any random topic, otherwise happy to conclude. <laughs> How's Jerusalem? We miss Jerusalem. <laughs> it's, the, it's the best. I, I love yeah. it here. It, it, it's not as physically beautiful as New Zealand, um, <laughs> but it makes up spiritual um, depth and meaning yeah nice <laughs> um okay great well if, if no yeah. one has any questions um it uh, looks like diana's speaking oh no not to me yeah if, if no one has any does anyone have a question Hi. robert yours is on okay so <laughs> so yeah i just want to thank you guys again for the opportunity um, and yeah, hope we, hope we have many more opportunities. And this was my favorite. You're the first group I'm learning with. I'm going now to learn with a group in Jerusalem, but I'm so glad that my first group that I learned with in the new year was you. And I really hope we can um, carry on to learn together. So Shana Tova Mituka.
תודה רבה. Thank you so much. שנה טובה. You guys can all unmute. Thank you and שנה טובה. Thank you, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. שנה טובה, מתוקה. שנה טובה, everyone. שנה טובה, רבי. תודה רבה, יגן. ביי. ביי, גייז. שנה טובה.